Hey everybody, I'm Jeffrey Stansfield, the ringmaster and CEO of eSports Circus. You can find everything about us at eSportsCircus.com on all the platforms, plus our website, eSportsCircus.com. If you have any questions, please do give us a call at 800-287-5095. That's 800-287-5095. We build teams for schools. We help build infrastructures and team development, monetizations, all that kind of stuff. We also help... Uh, with teams in our in our events, we host large, super large events for schools. We go out to your college and host events at your school, and pay you for the for the for the privilege of doing that. So it's incredible. To if you want to find out more about that, just go to our website, esportscircus.com, and click on the tab that says what we do for schools. Up next, we have an incredible panel run by Nick, who's a good friend of mine out of Irvine Goble. So check them out, and he'll tell you all about himself, and he'll also be introducing the other panelists, including my partner, Don Montoya. So check all those guys out. Here's the panel right for you. Hello, guys. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Nick Perazzi from Inman Global, and we are here at the Personal Wager PS5 Celebration launch event. We got 24 hours of footage, 24 hours of news, all sorts of cool streams going on. But today, we're going to be talking about a very important topic, how to find funding for your next gaming venture, for your next gaming adventure, for your next gaming launch, whatever you want, and we have some uh, decked out panel here. So why don't I get into the introductions? David, why don't you start? Tell us who you are, why are you here, and what do you want to talk about? Uh, so I'm David Fenlon. I uh, uh, run a company called Fenlon Associates, which is original, as you could probably tell. Um, I've been uh, asked here by Jeff for reasons which like now um, I've yet to understand, but uh, my um, uh, I, in that, that capacity, I advise uh, governments and brokers and investors, as well as uh, uh, brands coming into esports um, for um, a combination of uh, pushing jobs to um, uh, significant uh, multi million dollar investments to a um, uh, situation of uh, trying to get in as a sponsor into the industry. Um, I also um, I have a, a tech startup in the uh, media uh, world, which um, is going through the same sort of uh, uh, fundraising pieces, which like a lot of the uh, people in the audience be going through. So I understand firsthand what it's like um, at this point. And also, um, having been on both sides of it, I've got a, an idea of uh, some of the uh, pitfalls, but also some of the potential opportunities that are there for those who want to um, uh, really push this forward, especially in esports, which is just a, a, a really hot industry right now. Pitfalls is really the correct word for it. You know, uh, whenever you're dealing with an industry that's as popular and as many eyeballs on gaming, it's very, very easy to maybe get some false flags of success because look how many people showed up. But no, no, no. In, in this industry, you need to find something sustainable. You need to find something that scales. You need to find something that works in the long term. And uh, someone who can talk definitely a lot about experience uh, dealing with startups and trying to be able to gauge which ones are the ones you want to invest in. Uh, Brian, why don't you give us a quick... Um, intro about Excellent. Uh, name is Brian McMahon. Company is Expert Dojo. Uh, we are an investor here in Santa Monica in Silicon Beach. Uh, we've invested in about 45 companies this year, about 20 or 30 companies last year. And then we're looking next year to invest in about 100 companies. Uh, we love the esports space. We love the gaming space. And of course, everybody's trying to look for what's going to be the next most awesome, coolest game that's going to come out so we can get in there nice and fast, invest early, and then be there when uh, they start making loads of money. When our third a panelist finds himself secured, we kind of have a mystery third panelist going in and out. Jeff, are you here? Are you here? I am here, man. I'm here. Thank you so much, Nick. Well, I'm I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been I've run many a, a bunch of companies. Uh, I just you know we have a company that's been around 20 years called Advantage Video Systems. And last year, I I just was so amazed at the growth potential and the opportunities in the esports industry and the gaming industry. You know, it's a 100 140 billion dollar industry. Uh, you know, gaming industry is over two probably over two billion dollars by now. 
and you know I just saw a lot of potential there, and we kind of looked at where we could uh, we could we could work. Don and I have been friends with Brian for many many years, and you know Don, Don was part of Brian's thing way back in the day, and then uh, and and uh, so I, I got involved in that, and I I've, I've always been in, in you know into helping people with as much as I can into startups. And so I wanted to so I wanted to bring this. The eSports Circus is a collegiate uh, eSports venue that travels around the United States, going to colleges and setting things up. We have helped colleges build teams. We have a whole platform that's available. You can see it on eSportsCircus.com website and how we do things and the whole platform that we have. We're in a, it's an incredible startup, and we're just we're just launching. We had five events scheduled this year. Of course, we had to cancel it because the whole world caught a cold. And um, you know, I was on another another conference a couple about a week two weeks ago, and that's where I saw David, and I was really impressed with the with the breadth of knowledge that he brought to the panel and the things he had to say. And so I really wanted him to to come on this panel. And Nick, we met last year at at Irvine at at, a, at an event, and I've, we, we we've been talking. We met in China, and I've just you know these are people. By everyone here is a hilarious story as to how I ran. Well, thank you for that, Jeff. We really, we really appreciate you um, coming in here and um, stepping in for Don. You know, he couldn't be with us for some tech difficulties. But actually, I want to um, go back to something, David, that we were uh, speaking about before the call, actually. Uh, we were just talking about what it takes to, you know, get your um, a game idea of funding. And you actually said something very interesting about it. having having a good idea is not even close to the, you know, the obstacle you need to have. Having a good idea isn't something that automatically makes this easy. Can you kind of elaborate a bit on what you mean? Because I have a feeling a lot of people watching or a lot of people interested have a great idea and now they want a bunch of money for it. How can you kind of maybe point them in a more reasonable and rational direction? So I think that without without trying to basically tell people how to run a business because that's the sort of um the the trap that you always fall into when someone says well when you stop with an idea what do you do next i think that it's important to um it's important to understand that um one that there are loads of really good ideas out there um and there's some very very bright people who come up with them um it that idea um to the integrity of that idea and whether you're going to make lots and lots of money out of it okay really needs to be researched properly and you need to also think very carefully about um how you're going to get to a position where you're going to make money out of it so you know there's some basic pieces like understanding who's out there in the market who's doing it already what would i need to do to get this done and that's you know you will always find some there'll be somebody who has tried to do this before or tried to do a variation of it um and at that point it's not the point to be discouraged but it is a case of trying to work out a, a very basic process of trying to say right how can i do this is this worth doing okay if not can i adapt it etc um very mediocre me very mediocre ideas uh, sometimes make um, you know, tens of millions of dollars um, just because they're executed very well. So having a, um, a really dope idea doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. It's actually the follow through of that. So, you know, researching that is important. Also trying to work out how you're going to, uh, like, wh when, when do you get to a point where you break even? I mean, that journey in its own right is, you know, kind of half the battle in some ways of trying to actually um, work out whether there's a platform to try and speak to investors. But I think that, you know, research the idea, speak to uh, people in the industry and speak to people who are um, old hands at setting up businesses um, and serial entrepreneurs, because you'll start to get an idea of the sort of things you need to start looking at. But there's an enormous amount of back work that's needed in that. The idea will the, the idea will change. It will the integrity of it will change as well. You know, even if it's successful, like, you know, there's that some of the biggest companies in the world, their um, their ideas are not what they started with. 
Um, Google's a good example of that. Okay, Google wanted to charge originally. Okay, they quickly changed that idea um, when they realized that actually the model business model makes much more sense elsewhere. Like oh, that, that's a fundamental business change. So that so you know that's sort of where that's that's you know it's. That, that's the, that's kind of the problem you're dealing with when you start with this. It's not just the idea. The idea is the fun bit. It's the um, it's moving yeah. on next. It's the execution, it through. trying to make yeah, it yeah. through. And um, uh, Brian, this actually leads into a very impressive uh, number. You said you know, a uh, 45 uh, companies that you guys have already invested in this year, right? Like you're obviously seeing that now is you know, it's unprecedented times. Uh, now is the time you want to get in on some of these emerging industries, especially like gaming. So. When you are looking at a company, when you're looking at a startup, when you're looking at someone who has this idea, right? Does what David say, uh, is what David said a jive with you? Is it really a balance between the great idea so unique versus execution? Which do you weigh a higher when trying to decide whether or not you want to look further into a startup and actually invest? I mean, first of all, the vast, vast, vast majority of games will fail. I mean, you have to assume as a startup, if you're going to fit into even a reasonable statistic, your first four or five games are going to fail. There is no good idea or a great idea, like a car that's going to shoot out of the side of the car or like there's now, whether it's going to be mobile or whether it's going to be console, the majority will fail. And if you look at most of the games that have come from, I don't care if it's like Angry Birds or anything else, like the majority of them, they had five or six fails before they get to a victory, right? So... You have to look at that. When we look at folks, yeah, execution is tremendously important, but execution is only possible if we've got pedigree within the gaming space. So we had a, you know, a bunch of folks we invested in recently um, who were out of Epic Games, right? So we knew we had the product manager. We knew we had the UI guy. We knew we had a really good team that had the ability to build a game. Um, I would say one of our best investments in a gaming company, a publishing company, they just failed their most recent game, but they're so damn good. They brought it out. They built the game. The company's called Obscure Games. They brought it out. They built the game. They tested it in, in the Philippines, tested it over in Singapore and put did some small testing over in the US as well, did not hit them. Even though the game is epic, they, they didn't get the results that they wanted and they killed it within two weeks. And then what happens? They're a great publishing team. They're going to go straight back in again. They'll take the learns that they'll have and they'll move forward from that. So there, there's many times, look, we invest across the board. We, we, we like esports. We like gaming. Uh, we like this whole world. We think it's going to be really popular going forward. But the same principles apply from the beginning to the end. If you have never built a game before, and you are not with other boys and girls who are going to build a game. The chances of you building a great game is like tiny. And the f chances of, of, of a, I'm going to say, I don't want to say a smart investor because this isn't about smart investors or not smart investors. This is about experienced investors and not experienced investors. You can always find, as we say in Ireland, an Egypt to put money into your company, right? There, there, there are plenty of fools who are very happy to be parted with their money. You just have to knock on enough doors so you can actually find them. But if you want to find an institutional investor who's going to bring you to the stage that you need to, whereby you can raise about $2 million, which is what it takes to get a really great game to market after a couple of fails, then you need to be able to show them that you know what the hell you're doing doing and you're bringing in people that make you look like a serious company so um i think first of all i'm totally spot on man you guys gave some fantastic answers there i will say that the um, reality that even the best of games like you're right i've seen games that the quality's there it's amazing and yet they they can't even get the funding from their kickstarter right like this is a fully finished game but just no one wants it and sometimes that can be very very um discouraging especially if you're uh, following the logic of if my game is good it will succeed so working back from that what do you think are some of the common traits or maybe what are some of the things that the games that do succeed have in common you know what are maybe some of their goals or maybe what are some of the audiences they're trying to go have you guys and this is an open question for the both of you is there anything in your experience that you've seen uh, generally this seems to be a a popular type of game today or a, a, a game that you can maybe expect to see good promises from well, I, I, just, I suppose to jump in, I think that yeah. there's like the, the problem you have with a lot of if you, like esports um, is that there's 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 a whole wealth of potential 
uh, investment areas in esports, which aren't specific games. You you have gambling companies, you have teams, TOs, uh, you have um, uh, uh, performance tech, you have services, you have uh, locations, you have all the support structure around that. You have so much other stuff around this. So, you know, games may not necessarily be the best reflection of the whole esports industry, but they do have a key component in them that the launch is the kind of make or break. And that makes investors and other groups nervous because you don't know what the um what whether it's going to succeed or not so you could put a huge amount of money into something for it never to like for it to be excellent as uh, brian said and it like just flop because you didn't know so long beaters tend to help enormously because you're already starting off with like um you have essentially people um sometimes they pay for it okay to be on it a reduced rate sometimes they're just giving you um free feedback but you can actually end up with if you're finding revenue streams that can actually start supporting some of the um, some of the beta and some of the development of what you're trying to do, um, that can actually really, really help both your um, investor case, but also mitigate the risk that you're not actually going to um, be successful or if the um, or anything else. And I think that you know successful betas you see this from the smallest companies to the largest companies like valorant is a very good example and everyone uses it as one but you know uh, riot have worked out that long betas can actually be very very successful for them because you know they still can charge during that period of time um and um and again it's the work so i think that you you having hard launches i think is a very tough thing to do in esports especially when it's so community based so having that Having that long period, that long period of engagement where you can start to make money off stuff, really, really um, uh, helps with your investment case. Also sharpens um, the discipline of what you're trying to do around like uh, ROI and how you're going to um, talk to investors about that in particular. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the big. I think the biggest problem that they people have. There's two big problems about the biggest problems. One is and this is on what Brian said is the team. Most companies, most most startup companies start up and they and they have their best friend be their sales manager, they have their girlfriend be their marketing manager, and they get and and, and, and they're and they're thinking, well, we don't have any money, so I can't afford to hire a really good marketing manager, a really good sales manager. Well, then you're not gonna be successful. You need to hire a real sales manager to reach out, a real marketing company, and people don't understand that. This person may be your best friend and may be a wonderful person, but you need a shark to go out and sell your product. You need marketing people who know, who have serious, like with, like you know, serious experience in this industry, or you're going to spend, you're going to fail, fail, and fail. And then the other biggest problem that people do is when they, you know, mention about a Kickstarter thing. I see Kickstarter after Kickstarters when people are talking about. My game has this great feature, and my game has this bit, this great feature, and it can do all this. Well, investors could care less what your products do, and game and the users can care less. You, if you want to speak to users, you got to speak to the value that the users are going to get from that, from buying a product. And the investors want to know what's their value because they could care less. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, Brian, I think you had something you wanted to add on this before we... Yeah, it's a fa look, it's a fascinating space. We're fortunate here in LA. We got just some real legends uh, in the market, like even like Howard Marks at Activision, um, Noel Bushnell, if we go back to like one of the first ever games brought out, and now I'm really showing my age. And of course, we got we got Riot up the corner here as well. And every everything that David said and that Jeff has said by extension is, is absolutely correct. Just... The, the challenge with this, it's a little bit like, I love tennis, right? And, and what's the problem with getting me getting involved in something to do with tennis? Well, it's my, it's my hobby and my love first. So I go to work to do something I love. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's actually awesome. But you want to go to work to do something that you are awesome that but something that you also love. And there's a very subtle difference between the two. And if you do pick those people who you just happen to be your best friends and they happen to be really good at something as opposed to, I'm gonna pick some dude or dudette that I absolutely hate, but they are the greatest singular product manager that has ever lived on this planet. And they're gonna do, that's what builds it for you. Because what David spoke about beforehand is like the difference between gaming and esports and everything else is really just the difference in the cost of entry. Okay, so one of my LPs um, 
Kent, one of my partners there, a great guy, and he owns a esports team, uh, Gen Z, uh, who are doing really well. Um, but look, they probably has pumped 30, 40, 50 million dollars into that by now. Um, well, to get into a game, it's still going to cost you like two or three million dollars. All I'm just saying is like, these are big boy and girl numbers. Like, this is not, oh, I'm going to build a game. It's going to be cool. And me and my buddies are going to be around. Like, you've got to start from the position of if I'm going to need $2 million, $5 million, $20, $50, $100 million, how am I going to create the traction that's actually going to be able to repay that money back and make sure that the investors get a return on actually what they're putting in there? And that's why, like, the conversation that we had right at the start, Nick, about who are the really cool influencers of today? Like, who are the, who are the kids following? Like, you need to have that in mind that sometimes it is just you got a great game. For Fortnite, it hit its time, it was right, everybody loved it. But sometimes it's because you manipulate a situation based on the influencers that are around it, based on the time that you're in, and just based on something that just happened to be trendy in that particular moment. And you can get yourself something that can just go really, really well. But you have to start with that how am I going to generate monster traction, whether it's money or whether it's users? And when is that going to happen? And how do I track that back to when I'm starting? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And I'm really glad that you brought up a Fortnite because what some people don't know about Fortnite is, you know, it was a completely different game than what we see it as now, right? It it, it wasn't always a, uh, a battle royale. It wasn't always this massive multiplayer thing, right? And really, I think... The people behind that project, their their um, ability to see the flexibility that they um, needed to have, and also the um, ability for them to correctly identify, hey, you know this project we've been working on in this vision, maybe instead we should focus on the most popular genre ever right now, a battle royale. Maybe we should see if we could convert this existing game we already have, and of course they did, and the rest is history. No one knows or plays the real Fortnite game. We all play the Fortnite a battle royale, and uh, on the on the topic of uh, the opportunities in gaming and esports, right? In my experience, everyone knows uh, generally, even if you're not really endemic to the space, that wow, gaming and esports is popping right now. You know, we see the numbers on streams, we see the numbers. Everyone's talking about this new generation that watches streams more than anything, right? But it can sometimes feel as if, well, how do I get in then, right? How do I get in? What are what are the angles what are the solutions that still need um to be solved so this is just an open question and i'd be really interested in seeing some of your guys's um, takes on it what do you think are some of the more under underexplored um areas or maybe services or uh, products or types of things that the gaming industry and the esports industry still needs and people can still maybe start putting their minds and their creativity and their entrepreneur hats on solving okay i'll jump in here i'll yeah. jump in here let me let me take this one because i like yeah. this one because we're actually just about to make an investment into an augmented reality game uh, which is going to take the old uh, Ghostbusters back in the day, which is coming back again. But these these movies have got so you combine Hollywood and the movies with the traction and like huge raving fan. Like I would feel the same if it was Star Wars. Like if it was the same thing about Star Wars. And then you just bring because augmented reality. I don't know how long virtual reality is going to take. I don't know if if it was just a shitty 10 years that we'll never get back. Um, or if somehow these Apple glasses will turn into something which all of us oldies believe that's not possible after all of the screw ups before. But I do believe augmented reality is where we're going anyway, like irrespective of whether we, we stop and we actually, we do the virtual first, but augmented is going to be awesome. And Pokemon Go is just like that first little play at it and then everything went away and it has to be what's coming next now because all of the technology is just lined up for the most epic experiences in your own living room. I mean, and and uh, David, I'd love to get your point at this, but just I just want to really cement for those who may be listening to know, Pokemon Go was a cultural phenomenon. Pokemon Go changed the way people lived their life. It changed the way people viewed parks. It changed the way people used and worked in their city. During the heydays of Pokemon Go, you would literally see groups of gamers of all ages, the most diverse group of people all gathering for the same 
of in-game objectives. It's really unlike um, anything I've ever seen, and I've been gaming my entire life. So yeah, I, Brian, I think you're definitely onto something. Um, augmented reality has the way to blur the lines between what is a game and what is just real life in-person event, real life in-person interaction. And I think that speaks to a much larger um, audience in this core, maybe 18 to 30 year old male that's pretty much what the gaming industry has been trying to capture for the last 20 years. There's a lot more things you can do, I think, when it's all on our phone or when it's as something as intuitive as just looking at my video and seeing the world has been made more fantastical. It's a really great answer. David, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So Pokemon Go actually kind of captures both the good and the bad of like uh, the opportunities out there. So you have something which basically the, the support tech around this, okay, it's just the, the opportunities is, is absolutely, it could go gangbusters, but it wasn't thought through fully by Nintendo. So the result is they didn't monetize it. And that is that that was the sort of, that 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 is kind of the problem you have with esports a little bit at the moment is that you do have these absolutely fabulous like tech support tech companies which are doing like you know a performance on like what you're doing okay like actually like doing 3d and like, there's all sorts of different groups that like uh, i can reel off here you have like um a large number of like uh, locations which are venues are popping up everywhere okay and actually have a sustainable business model off the back of it and creating this infrastructure you have um you know all of these products and services you have fashion brands coming into esports okay which are just ripe for being taken over by um an lvmh coming in okay like any of these fashion brands coming there's the the the, the crossover now is 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 so is so strong because the audiences don't see the boundary between video gaming and all the other stuff that they do uh, they don't they certainly don't see the difference between esports and uh, video gaming they don't see the difference between digital and physical they and they they want they they want to be able to try this stuff out so the thing with the, i think that the the principle i take from this is that, that ultimately you need to think through to a certain extent um how you're going to monetize that audience because that audience is willing to pay look at look at the battle pass for um dota 2 okay you have 40 million us dollars is um is prize money for the international of which 2 million of that has been put forward by valve and that's actually not a, the full story because 25% of the battle pass goes towards the prize pool. So Valve actually has taken you know well over uh, uh, 140 million dollars just of that. Okay, and that and the donations, um, uh, the donation side of the industry is massive. So you that just demonstrates that you have a huge audience which has money which is giving money away, literally giving money away because there's nothing to spend it on. Okay, so if you get your price right, okay. And you know how to monetize it this audience wants to pay and that's why this is so bloody exciting but the problem is that like i think a lot of people are really cool think this is cool tech or this is a really cool product but haven't thought about that last right. that last five percent that five last five percent makes the difference between you being um a company that turns over 10 million 20 million us okay a year uh, with a net profit of um, you know, 60% to somebody who's struggling just to like, you know, make your uh, um, uh, debt payments. I actually have a question uh, specifically for you because I think you'd be well poised for answering this. And it kind of goes into what um, David was talking about. First of all, um, I have... I have seen so many people compare esports and gaming to sports, right? Uh, especially five years ago, that was kind of the first way that a lot of people could understand what was going on. But just like uh, David say uh, says, it was the revenue of sports that a lot of people thought we could recreate through esports and gaming. But there's a big difference. Every time you get a sports fan to um, open up their wallet, the average cost is around $55. Like that's just the average spend they spend on average. But if you do that same work, the same amount of things, and you finally got an esports fan to open their wallet, the average is about $3, right? So you're absolutely right. You know, we have been able to create the audience, the movement, the culture, but no one has been being able to create the premium experiences that we already know young people want to buy. So Jeff, with the a knowledge that you know sports has already succeeded in finding things for people to buy and that's why they can make all this money off their their competition and their tournaments but gaming and esports often fails what do you think are some type of um 
of ways or a method in which people looking to monetize their gaming venture or their gaming project, what are some of the things that you think gamers would want to pay for? What are some of the traits or some of the tropes of a premium gamer um, experience that can maybe make us get up to even closer to that $50 range that we know uh, the sports industry uh, benefits from and relies on so much? So there's a couple of misclaimers there. Well, I mean, first of all, you got to look at sports. Sports, people have been playing football for o over 100 years, okay? First 25, 30 years of football, nobody made any money. There was, not, there was no real monetization on football. Yeah, there's a lot of money made in professional football, collegiate football now. Because we've learned how to monet, we've learned over the time how to monetize and reach out to fans and get them to buy box seats, get them to buy all this stuff that they do. The second, the second, and, and, and esports is years old. It's like in its infancies. So we're so esports e is taking lessons from traditional sports and how to monetize it, but we're still in its infancy. Second disclaimer, misclaim, mis kind of miscommunication is that. People say, "Oh, there's, you know, I only get three bucks from a player because I'm gonna because he buys a skin or he buys this." But there's a lot of other monetization platforms for for in in, in the esports arena. Like, for instance, you look at Hundred Thieves and their and their apparel uh, business. Hundreds of they make like take, take, they make ten million dollars in 2019. Okay. There's a lot of ways to, you know, yeah, we're not selling box seats. We're not selling, you know, we're not selling uh, World's Fargo a box seat in the League of Legends arena. You know, there are some. I mean, the 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 the, the Houston arena, the 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 the, the, the uh, Vegas arena, the Hawaii arena, even the, even the Arlington arena. They're learning how to, you know, they're selling box seats. They're selling. The, they're bringing brand. We're bringing brands into this into their stadiums. To do that, so there's a there are a lot of ways, you know. But there's also an education. I mean, you know, uh, last year I, I, I talked with Mark Deppy over at Irvine, and he said, and he told me there's no way to monetize collegiate esports. I get, you know, I throw a big game and get a couple thousand people to watch my game. And I think, and but now, you know, Mark is like, yeah, there's there's definitely monetization opportunities in esports, but it's it's learning. We're, we're, we're launching, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, this incredible game. It's a great console. Well, you know, and they, but they don't equate that purchase of that game and that console to esports. They equate it to gaming. So, you know, where that revenue actually ends, you know, is part of esports, is you know, is that so apparel, game, games, game consoles, and PCs. You know, people are people are spending ten thousand dollars building their personal home gaming system. You know, so. Uh, I think you're both correct in bringing up uh, the apparel uh, side of it, right? You can actually check out um, inmaglobal.com slash culture. We've actually made a f huge pivot to covering the news of esports fashion, esports music, um, gaming art. Like we really have seen just from our own site traffic and from the way that people are embracing it, that a lot of people now that gaming and gamer has become a term of identity that is positive. It's not something that is negative. It's something that is mainstream accepted. We know that gamers can be fun and popular. You know, the all of those old tropes about gamers in their basements, they don't work anymore when we see them every day on Twitch and they're the obviously the people having the most fun in the room. So I think people are starting to enjoy being able to buy an $80 hoodie because it's their favorite team and they're proud of being a gamer. With that in mind, uh, back to some of the uh, uh, demographics that I um, mentioned earlier. We have on our site um, in the global, we have seen more women of readers than ever before on our site. And this is when we cover things like um, uh, a KDA, which is the virtual a K pop band starring a League of Legends characters that a Riot put out. We get more traffic than ever when we do talk about um, 
uh, esports fashion. There's new esports makeup brands actually coming out, right? So I I think that part of why the question on how do we make esports revenue was so important is because it actually begs a further question that is some it is way more relevant. How do we expand the invitation to games and esports towards the largest possible group of people? And that includes women, that includes people who have already aged out of the bracket and think that they're too old to play games, but that's not true. There's a game for everyone. So I'd be very curious, uh, Brian, if you have some insights, what do you think are some of the demographics that through gaming have traditionally been under um, explored and is now possibly a wide open because gaming has gotten so much more mainstream. Yeah, I, I, so it's a super interesting conversation. I'm with Jeff on the on the money. I'm fine. Like if we get if our if our next game that comes through obscure games just happens to get just really good stickiness and people who love the game and they're there, I I could care less about money. And most VCs care less about profitability, right? The only thing we want to be able to see is a massive ownership of the market. Like it's no different to a Slack or an Uber as a Riot Games. It works the same way. And then when it comes to new demographics, I always find this is a really interesting question. Like on on one level, look, it's always good, and it's it's nice to say we want to have more women involved in e-gaming. But I mean, why? Like, I mean, does anybody really care? Is does it really? I'm just saying, like, if do we do do we have a conversation? Say, hey, we want to get more women involved in. in no, more women involved wouldn't they spend more money? Like in the most practical. Mm -hmm. sense but of but maybe, but maybe, maybe yeah. if there was more women involved in soccer, are we going to get more money in soccer that's going to be spent, or in American football, or something else? So mm -hmm. I'm not saying there should be more women, or I'm not saying there shouldn't be more women. I'm just saying we're in this world right now where unless everybody gets an equal opportunity to be able to take part in absolutely everything, then we don't feel like we're saying all of the right things. So I think that if look, we know what drives usage, influence from people that they uh, people admire normally drive usage, right? If tomorrow, all of the female influencers, and I mean the really young influencers, they started getting involved in gaming, and that's what we know that would drive gaming. I'm just saying that it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Like sometimes it can just be, you find the absolute best demographic that love what you're doing more than anybody else in the entire world, and they become your raving fanatical fans, and you just focus everything on those people. And, and, and again, if, if, if women, more women end up coming in, awesome. If more grannies come in, if more granddads come in, like, great, God bless them. They should all come in. Everybody should. But does that mean that we want to focus as investors on taking something which has a lower return versus something which has a huge return on the basis that the stuff that has a huge return are people who absolutely love what our stuff is doing anyway? Just I'm just saying be careful. That's all. It's a dangerous road. One second. You mentioned grandmas and grandpas. Uh, I have a sneaking um, suspicion that when the entire generation of gamers my age are in retirement homes or in seniors, it's like, I'm just going to want to game the whole time. I'm just going to want to play MMOs with all my old buddies. And, you know, maybe in 30, 40 years, we'll see a huge boom of these retirement homes focused on gaming and all have a fiber optic. So, yeah, I think that's a really nuanced point, though. Maybe, you know, in this uh, uh, early stages of gaming and esports, your point is then maybe we should focus on locking up the audience we have. Really trying to create up yeah. People who, I mean, look what's happening in sports right now. During yeah. the pandemic, we are finding that actually with younger people, there are hardly anybody going after NBA or any of the other sports that are non esports or non games. Like their demographics are dropping in almost everything with the exception of mixed martial arts. Right. Mixed martial arts is winning. E-gaming is winning massively. Virtually all of the other sports are going down. So to your point, those people who 20 years ago, man, they loved their March Madness, and that's what they lived for all year. Now, those people are now 30, 40, 50, 60. They still love their March Madness. They're not going to start hating it. So the more important point is, how do we make sure that the best possible demographic for our particular sport, whatever that is, is actually spending the maximum amount of money and the maximum amount of time on us. That's I love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. That's the most practical advice I think I've heard all week. Uh, David, you, you had something you wanted to add to this conversation. Yeah, so there's a saying in poker that you go for the easy, the easy money at the table, not the hard money, okay? So um, 
there's that said um what's interesting about esports in particular and video gaming is that um there are very limited products out there at the moment in comparison to everything else and you can do the, and it's not just you know um physical products although there's a drastic lack of them that's the reason why we're seeing so many um, so much merchandise in the per apparel but you're also seeing some of the tech stuff which brian's talked about now this all said you know some studies have shown that um 52 percent of gamers worldwide are women you know um you uh pope g in india is india's largest dating app or was before it was banned the same could be said for honor of kings right so like the point i'm getting at here is that um you know if you're um a, a entrepreneur listening in and so forth there are niches here and um there is money to be made the problem you have as brian's kind of alluded to is that we have the attention of one audience that has a fair bit of cash i mean like on average they make over um fifty thousand us um uh, a year because of the education they have but you know the 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 point is, we, we, we haven't done a very good job of actually being able to um, uh, get them to spend money on this because they want to. So that's one piece. But if you are an entrepreneur and looking at this, you could actually end up going for markets which um, aren't really being exploited or at least not being addressed in products. So that's one way just to think about it um, and just making sure that you can um, you can do it. Now, I don't think that you're going to do very well out of uh the 60 plus market for instance because it just you don't have the volume for it but um there, there are um niches you can carve out and make a lot of money out of i love the i love the reality that PUBG in india was you know because there's so much social activity going there we actually see the same thing over in china in which gaming with just your phone at a cafe or at a tea shop has become the the primary means for young people, men, uh, uh, boys and girls to just interact. When you go on a date over in China or we hang out, you don't go to the mall or something. You go to a cafe with high speed internet and you play your game. So yeah, I think there is a lot of, of nuance there in which people can maybe see some of the, the social ways in which gaming is solving some problems or you know adding some ease and find ways in which we can carve out different markets so we only have two minutes left so our panel is winding down now so i want to give everyone just one last chance and maybe what is the one piece of information that you would want to leave with someone who you know they've stuck with us the whole time they're still jazzed about their idea they're still jazzed about their prospects and they're like yep this is what i want to do i'm going to try to find funding and i'm going to try to make this a reality what is the one thing that you'd like to leave them with and brian we can start with you because i know you have a heart out okay so first esports and gaming is just the most awesome industry and, and nick you mentioned it at the start like it was the thing the teacher said to you if you're going to play this thing your whole life you're going to end up a loser like your friends around you and and they could not have been more wrong. The the people who have really got into this sport, whether they've just been professional e-gamers or whether they've started e-games teams or whether they've been folks who've started gaming and done really well from it, they're worth more than the schools are worth right now. This is a really, really important industry. David mentioned about the support industries around us. There are multi, multi-billion dollar companies and many of them. There are lots of investors that are looking at this space right now. I would say the last nine months or so of the pandemic have only reinforced this multiplied by like a hundred times. This is a great space. There's lots of money to be made, but just approach it the way you would approach any other business. Am I fit for purpose? Am I good at what I'm doing? Am I surrounded by people who fill the skill gaps to make sure that we can actually achieve what we want to achieve? And if it goes wrong, if Murphy's Law comes and hits me in the face, I actually, just to digress for a second, I like David's thing on the poker table because my dad used to say to me, whenever you look around the poker table and you don't see the patsy, well, then that's you. Buddy, right? <laughs> so, so just make sure you're not the friggin' patsy at the poker table, okay? When you launch your startup, that's it. That's all I got. Dude, love it, love it. And uh, David, and then uh, Jeff. So, um, there's so much you could give advice on, but the one thing I would say to you is make sure you get yourself a world class team with you. 
you need to make sure that the team you bring on board, each individual is better than you. Because anyone who's worse than you, you know that already. That's 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 useless. You need someone who's you need to have a, a really good team with really good experience, okay, who will be able to help you with your like who will say no to you, okay, and will also uh take not just the work off you, but also provide strengths where your weaknesses are. Um, you know, as a CEO of a company, you have you Yes, you're supposed to put out the direction, that's for, for sure, but you have one job and your one job, okay, is to make sure that the resource is there for your team to succeed. And that is typically cash, but not always, okay? It can be getting the right team members in place. It goes back to your team. Get your team right, okay? And your job then is to look after the cash. So make sure you have a really bloody good team because if you don't, okay, you will not, your money will come out of your wallet to pay for somebody who's useless who's ripping you off okay and will may may well result in your business maybe yeah true words true words and jeff why don't you i'll close this out i i i yeah going on the staff thing you know it's you know always there's an old adage in in, in, in any kind of business which is hire slow fire fast so when you do hire people make sure you do your research on them and and and, and, and take your time doing it there's no rush but I would say the one thing that I would say that, is, that we learned, especially this year, is to make sure you have a pivot plan. You know, we went into this year and, and saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to start the company by hosting events. We're going to go to colleges and we're going to host these like esports events. And we had five big giant events scheduled this year. And then the whole world caught a cold. We had to cancel every one of them. So we pivoted the company. And, and concentrate on working with schools to help build their teams, working to build their infrastructure, working to build their their coaching styles, and you know learning how to brand and marketing their team. So, have a pivot plan in your company because what's coming next is going to hit you in the face, and there's always something going to hit you in the face. It may not be a pandemic, but learn have a pivot plan in your business, and I think that's that. Awesome. Yes, yes. I'd also like to uh, second those thanks. It's been a really fun uh, conference for me. I've learned a lot and had some good laughs. So what more can you ask for? Uh, so uh, this has been your panel on how to find an investment or capital for your gaming venture. I guess we're going to give a shout outs to personalwager.com and their PS5 a celebration for bringing us all here. So my name is Nick Durazio. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick Durazio 3 rd And uh, do you guys want to have any social media shout outs before we, we close? No, thank you, gents. Listen, if you anybody wants to contact me, I'm very approachable. It's just Brian at expertdojo.com. But um, otherwise, just be a great gamer. Cool. Yeah. You stay classy, San Diego. All right. Bye, guys. Awesome. See you later. Cheers. I'm Jeffrey Stansfield. I'm the ringmaster of Esports Circus. I'd like to invite you to come and run with the circus. The Esports Circus helps schools develop esports teams and host in-person events at the schools, allowing students to play on massive stages they might not get the opportunity to do. The problem in the industry is that most schools don't know how to develop teams, monetize teams, or recruit students and find career paths, among many other issues. For example, most schools build a land center when building out their esports area, putting many computers on desks next to kids like they did in the 80s. This workflow is not flexible and opens the door to things like vandalism, theft, and uploading of dangerous stuff. The esports circus has a proven workflow that can secure and can move the system anywhere on campus in minutes. Schools usually are too far away from large stadiums, and the stadiums don't like to host collegiate events because it hasn't been as much profit as hosting professional events. We handle this issue by working with schools to develop programs to meet their needs and work with student clubs to bring their dreams alive of having an esports team on campus. We host events at schools, bringing the esports circus 
to the schools. We invite other schools from around the area in a massive circus environment. At the eSports Circus, the college and high school athletes can compete on stages and participate in other activities to help foster STEM creativity with eSports, robotics, virtual reality, game design, production, and many other disciplines. The eSports Circus gives profits back to the schools to help them build their program. If a school hosts us on campus, they get 5% off the profits. We also have opportunities for hosting schools and participating schools to share in revenues with a 25% discount on ticket sales and a 50-50 sponsorship revenue split on all sponsorships they bring in. Even though we have recently launched, we have many years of experience behind us. I'm a broadcast engineer with over 30 years of experience building hundreds of TV stations all over the country. Other executives have over 10 decades of experience in marketing, branding, production, social media, and sports. This year, we actually received the prestigious STEM certification for outstanding achievement in our past and our revolutionary program for developing a full package of STEM activities for schools. If you have any questions about our program, please visit our website, esportscircus.com, and I will see you at the circus.